We are here for another edition of Ask an Expert, and today we are talking to Dr. Linda Burke, who is a board-certified OBGYN, and we're going to be talking about uh, really a number of questions that really can help women understand how to better advocate for themselves, what to expect in pregnancy, and particularly around um, blood pressure issues in pregnancy. Of course, we're dealing with a time right now with the COVID crisis that just layers on all kinds of added um, strains to the healthcare system, as well as to pregnant and expectant moms who um, who are facing a lot of unknowns, a lot of unknowns. So um, Dr. Burke, if you could just start with what advice you might have for women who are currently pregnant um, and possibly going to be delivering in the next several weeks. Okay, so if they're going to be delivering in the next several weeks, they will probably still be in the midst of the COVID pandemic. And things have changed in terms of um, the way things are done um, regarding delivery, regarding postpartum care. So one of the most important things they need to do is number one, establish a point of contact uh, regarding communication with their healthcare provider. They need to know um, how to contact them um, or is there a substitute um, that they would be dealing with as opposed to their physician. Um, I heard a story recently about a patient who showed up at the hospital um, because she couldn't find her obstetrician and she ended up being delivered by a laborer. So these kinds of issues are cropping up in the, in the setting of COVID. They should also be prepared um, for one person. If they are going into labor, uh, the rules have changed based on um, people who are asymptomatic carriers of COVID. So most hospitals are only allowing one person, uh, one support person to be accompany the, the patient. That's another issue. Anytime they have to go to the hospital, they need to bring some sort of protective gear. Um, at bare minimum, they should have a mask, a face mask, because um, there might not be one available uh, at the institution that they're going to. So that's another issue. Are there any other kinds of what if scenarios, particularly when we're talking about women who might be at higher risk for preeclampsia, or maybe they've even been diagnosed with preeclampsia? What are some of those what if scenarios that women might need to be um, thinking about? Because we know there's a, a real benefit to having your expectations set as opposed to being completely surprised. Right, so the what if questions really need to come from the patient because everyone has different needs. But um, some of the questions they might want to ask is, um, will I be screened for COVID? It's an evolving condition situation. It depends on where you are geographically. Some hospitals have universal screening for COVID for everyone. And universal screening is different from diagnostic testing because if you have no symptoms, it's called screening. If you present with symptoms like a fever or um, any GI symptoms, uh, cough, uh, anything that um, anything that makes you what's called a PUI, a person. Um, under investigation, which basically means that you know you, there's a presumptive diagnosis, you're you're COVID and you're COVID positive until proven not, um, you're going to be tested. So they need to find out um, are they going to be tested or screened once they enter a hospital. Uh, then, if they are COVID positive, what? what is the treatment plan? What's going to be different in terms of their delivery? Some um, COVID positive patients are being delivered in negative pressure delivery rooms, which means that all of the air is forcefully moved out of the room um, 
the mechanism, the thought for the mechanism of that is that you're removing contaminants when you force the air out of the room. So will they be in a pressure, um, a pressure delivery room? Um, will they be isolated? Postpartum care is also going to be important because um, most hospitals, depending upon where you are, if you're in a hot spot, a hot zone, mm -hmm. um, more than likely all of the rooms, the inpatient rooms are being designated for COVID patients. So many postpartum patients are being moved either out of the hospital to a hotel or some uh, institutions are using telehealth as a way of conducting a postpartum exam. What can women do to optimize a telehealth experience that they may have with their provider? Okay, so uh, in our medical training, the most important thing is to obtain a patient history, which means a patient's story. In telehealth, it would be very helpful for the healthcare provider if the patient is able to provide as much of her history as possible, meaning, um, let's say this is a, a, a telehealth prenatal visit. Um, it would be very helpful to the provider if you would be able to say, um, I'm the last time I was here, I was this amount of weeks. I know I'm supposed to be, let's say 28 weeks. I felt my baby move um, at least three times a day since the last time I saw you. Uh, my weight gain has been uh, three pounds. Uh, and my blood pressures, I've been monitoring, self-monitoring my blood pressures, and they've been, and then provide the values for them. That would be very, very helpful. And then, of course, um, if you have any unusual conditions, if you had any bleeding, uh, if you think you ruptured your membranes, if you um, have a pain that's significantly different, anything that is unusual, those are also the things that should be provided to the healthcare professional. So this is where that list of signs and symptoms for preeclampsia really comes in handy because you mm -hmm. can sort of check through that and go, you know, what's been happening, headaches, uh, nausea, any kind of unusual swelling, uh, uh, as you mentioned, new pain, you know, if I'm feeling pain in my upper quadrant, or sometimes people feel it in their neck or shoulders, but being able to go through that list of um, symptoms and mm -hmm. report on each one of those to your provider. Right. Telehealth, um, I think, will probably be one of the um, technologies that will will remain even after this pandemic is over. It's been here. Um, the healthcare profession has been very slow to engage in it, but I think people are going to actively um, use this technology. So I say that because um, women will feel, and even men, um, you will feel, as you said, a greater sense of engagement in terms of your health care. So let's think about this in the context of pregnancy and hypertension. You've had your baby. It's, it's now time to go home. Let's talk about that postpartum. How can women uh, be prepared for what they need to report and engage with their provider in that postpartum period? Probably still through telehealth. Um, what kinds of things might be different or the same as their prenatal care? Yeah, so self-monitoring um, self of blood pressure is definitely going to be important in the postpartum period. Um, and they should receive parameters in terms of like numbers, like call us if your blood pressure is, and then this number that hopefully they've been given. Um, they should also be mindful of... Um, swelling, unusual swelling. Um, you do have excessive swelling sometimes during pregnancy, just based on the physiology of pregnancy. But once you've delivered, once the placenta has delivered, um, women usually um, uh, diuresis, usually they, um, they lose fluid. So if you are still, if your legs still look like balloons, you know, like two weeks out from your delivery, that's not normal and that should definitely be reported. And then um, it's it, like if they're using the telehealth uh, model, um, the visual, you'll have an opportunity to actually show uh, things that you're concerned about. You can, I don't know if, you'll, if they'll have a camera or 
usually it's some sort of medium. A lot of people are using telephones, but the ideal telehealth uh, visit is uh, where you can have visual video context. So if there's something uh, physically uh, wrong or you are concerned about, then you would be able to visually show your healthcare provider with a camera. So we, we're encouraging women to self-monitor some of the symptoms that they may have for preeclampsia. Mm -hmm. If a woman does have symptoms for preeclampsia, what should she do? She should immediately go to the hospital. Don't go to the emergency room, don't go to labor and delivery. Go to because, labor and delivery. Yes, yeah, I think that's one of the, uh, the mistakes that uh, women make, pregnant women make, is that they present initially to the ER. Labor and delivery, after 20 weeks, labor and delivery is your emergency room. That's where you go, because those nurses are trained um, and they're laborers. Some hospitals have laborers, uh, who are trained specifically in obstetrical problems. So that's where you should go if you're concerned. If you have clinical conditions that suspect preeclampsia, those need to be addressed professionally. And time delay is not your friend um, in the setting of preeclampsia. The other thing I want to talk about is um, there is, um, and, and these things are in real time, they're just emerging, but um, COVID also has similar clinical presentations to preeclampsia. For example, COVID positive patients have low platelets, preeclamptic patients have low platelets. And so there, is a, there seems to be an overlap between HELP syndrome and COVID. And uh, because COVID, one of the risk factors for COVID is, um, for pregnant women, is the development of uh, preterm birth and preeclampsia. So there's this overlap. So if you're not tested, if we don't know that you're COVID positive, we think that you just, that your clinical presentation just represents uh, preeclampsia, we're not addressing your respiratory issues. And what ha what's been happening is, you know, in, in certain hotspots, um, New, New Orleans, as an example, what's been happening is that patients are admitted with a presumptive diagnosis of preeclampsia of the HELP syndrome, and then they de after they deliver, they develop a fever. And then the whole clinical management changes. So it's really, really important for patients who had a previous history of preeclampsia or who have mild preeclampsia, please go to the hospital to be managed. Dr. Burke, in your experience um, in working specifically with women of color, are there, is there particular advice that you might offer uh, women of color in advocating for themselves that is any different or additional to what we've been talking about? I would recommend that women of color focus on the outcome that they want. Um, we know that there are problems in terms of misunderstanding of cultural diversity. Um, sometimes there's a lack of cultural diversity training. But I would strongly recommend that you approach the situation um, from the perspective of what you want as opposed to what you want you don't want but somehow you have to be able to navigate um, those conditions respectfully to get to the other side of what you want uh, which is a healthy birth outcome so, so mentally, um, there, what, what I hear you saying is focus on the positive outcome that undoubtedly all parties are interested in achieving, right? So healthy mom, healthy baby, focus mm -hmm. on that emotionally, mentally, be thinking that that's what you want. And then um, presumably that can also translate in what you're talking about and how you're communicating with your healthcare provider. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but talk a little bit about 
what a woman can do or say that translates from this mental shift that you're encouraging women to have. It may not even be a shift. It's, it's just a focus area. Yeah, I don't think it's a shift. I think it's a focus. Yeah. Um, but there is, um, you know, we sometimes get caught in the problem as opposed to the answer, the solution. And so my advice would be to focus on, um, yeah, when you enter a health care system as a woman of color, you know, you're aware of the potential of whatever. You might be insulted. People might not hear what you say, et cetera, et cetera. You know that. But don't go in to the situation expecting that. You're, uh, You're aware of it. Now, if you encounter it, of course, then you advocate. And I think um, based on the, um, the education that has happened through many uh, groups, I think women are well aware, women of color are well aware now that they do need to advocate. But what I'm saying is um, focus on the outcome, which is a healthy baby. Very positive messages, uh, even in the midst of crisis. I think everyone knows that the um, the joy of bringing a baby into this world is ultimately what we can focus on, in the, even in the midst of crisis. And Absolutely, I- and it is um, it is, in my humble opinion, um, one of the greatest gifts that we have been given is to recreate, to procreate uh, ourselves. And a birth is a miracle. And I really uh, would love for more women to get that, that you're carrying a miracle. It's a sacred moment. And yeah, you know, your birth plan may not in this setting, you know, of, of crisis, your birth plan um, may not be fully activated, but um, the ultimate is to go home with a healthy baby in your arms. Thank you so much. That is uh, our edition of Ask an Expert with Dr. Linda Burke. Thank you so much for being with us. My pleasure.